ahead. Welcome friends to our very first session and apologies that we ran a couple of minutes late some technical glitch. So our first session here is creating equity in workspace together we prosper. Why is it that women in spite of having the same levels of education as men keep losing out on employment and growth opportunities? Just think about all the women looking for meaningful employment opportunities after they take career breaks. What is it that we really need to do to tap into the tremendous latent talent in the economy? And to discuss this, we have a panel of very seasoned leaders moderated by none other than our own Shilpa Ajwani, a committed and dedicated change agent. She practices what she preaches every inch of the way. She has held many leadership roles, the last one being as the MD of Tupperware India. She is currently founder and CEO of Uno Mantra. She has been associated with Talentomics for almost five years now and is a part of the advisory council. Last but not the least, she's one of my favorites too. Over to you, Shilpa. Thank you, Nikita. Hello and a warm welcome everyone to a conversation that feels urgent to have in our world that is emerging out of a pandemic but is going into turmoil, strife, recessionary fears, and uncertainty. In this context today, we are going to discuss our topic, creating equity in workspace, together we prosper. Women are 49.6%, almost half of the world's population. They are said to be responsible for 80% of the consumption uh, decisions in the world. And yet, they are only 38.8% of the working population. Even though the world is seeing more women graduates emerge, their participation in the workforce still remains low. And as has been in every crisis, COVID is no exception the percentage of women participation in the workforce has actually declined during and post the pandemic. This means we still haven't figured it out. We still haven't found a way to bring them back into the workforce and engage them productively in a sustainable way. And this is where, you know, it is strange that we live in a world today where there are so many more conversations the rich, credible research is available. So many discussions are happening at every level, which tell us that how an equitable environment benefits everybody. It impacts the GDP of countries positively, the bottom line of organizations, and even allows us to have a more sustainable world. And even then, as countries and organizations are trying harder perhaps to get more women positively engaged, the World Economic Forum tells us that we are still 132 years away, 132 years away from narrowing the gender gap in economic participation. That's why today it feels urgent to discuss equity at the workspace so that all women benefit, rural and urban both. And together we can hope to live in a world that's more prosperous more equitable. Joining me today is a very esteemed panel who will deliberate and have a rich conversation around this topic. To allow us to have meaningful insights, ideas, and strategies for you to take away from this discussion today, we are actually going to center the entire discussion around three broad themes. The first being that how can more women come into non-stereotypical roles, get away from the safer roles into more core functions, also be seen at leadership levels and in our boards, making significant contributions. How can we, second theme, how can we involve the current leaders that we have sitting in organizations and in uh, politics to engage more women in all roles and have a stronger pipeline of women leaders and create more role models within the organizations. Thirdly, how can we 
ensure a more equitable future at work, both in the organized as well as unorganized sectors, in the urban as well as the rural sectors. What can we do and what can India do to leapfrog in this direction and use technology, new age policies, infrastructure development, a mindset change and everything else that's so needed so that we don't take 132 years, we move faster. So these are the three broad themes around which we will deliberate and discuss. And let me now quickly introduce you to our amazing panel. For all of them, it's been their life's work, not just profession, but also a passion to see this happening in their lifetimes and beyond for sure, that equity becomes a norm and doesn't remain an ideal we are striving for. I would like to first introduce you to Nishi Vasudeva, who is an independent board director and consultant today. She's had an illustrious career where she retired as chairperson and managing director of Hindustan Petroleum Corporation Limited. She's been a trailblazer and a role model for all professionals, women in particular. And what really is most impressive is that she dared to break a glass ceiling. Very few in the world would have agreed could ever be broken. So she's been a pioneer for us. Welcome, welcome Nishi to the panel today. Thank you, Shilpa, thank you. We have Aditya Ghosh, who's a business leader and co-founder of Akasa Air. Um, you would definitely know him as the former president and full-time director of Indigo Airlines. And he's currently on the board of directors for many, many organizations. He is a very keen investor in multiple startups. But what very few people know about is his amazing work with several women organizations, very notably so as the chairperson of the Social Enterprise Central Body of Self-Employed Women's Association, SEVA. And on a good day, you could see him in the run of Kutch making a bhakri with all the, the SEVA women uh, trying to see if he passes or fails their test and pass he did. So congratulations, Aditya. Welcome to the panel as a Fortune Global and India 40 under 40 leader and illustrious uh, uh, you know, uh, career progression your way. We're very happy to have you on this panel with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. We also have Dr. Sondarya Rajesh. She is an award-winning social entrepreneur founder and president of the Aftar Group. Her untiring work for many, many years has made many corporates wake up to the whole idea of gender equity in the workplace. It is her untiring efforts that we see allowing 100,000 women to think and imagine of a career once again and get back to work. She was one of the earliest voices speaking out for gender balance and is a thought leader on diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as an early stage innovator in the space of DEI tech as well. Welcome, Dr. Sondarya. Very happy to have you with us. Thank you, Shilpa. Our fourth panelist today is Anuradha Khosla. She's Senior Vice President HR, Global Head DEI, talent development and employee engagement at HCL. Anuradha is a multi-dimensional HR leader with over 29 years of experience spanning multiple facets of HR. But what I really love from my conversation with her a few days back is that HCL is deploying cutting edge strategies to ensure more equity at the workplace. But she feels in spite of some amazing results, she has just only begun. And we'll hear more from Anuradha as the discussion progresses on how was this possible and what more can we expect. So let's get right now into the panel. So warm welcome Anuradha as well. And, Thank and you. Uh, definitely want to hear a lot more of your success as we uh, dive into the questions. So Nishi, I would like to ask uh, the first question to you. So, You've been a rare woman uh, in the world to head a large company in the oil sector. 
Now, you know, seeing yourself as a CMD of HPCL obviously didn't come in a day. It must have required long years of perseverance, hard work, grit. Also, the, the ability to take risk and perform a lot of uh, um, operational roles, which might be core as well as non-core. So, so what would you say um, can be done to encourage more women to take up core operational roles so that they don't just stay comfortable with the safer bets, right? So like I say, they take a risk and that risk takes them all the way to the top to break the glass, glass ceiling. That's the first question. I actually have a second part to that. Now, again, when you find yourself in board meetings as an independent board director, you again must be finding far too few women sitting in those board meetings, right? Uh, any advice that you can give to all our participants and change makers today that what more can organizations do and leaders do so that we actually have a more robust pipeline of women, leaders as well as board members making a significant contribution, not a token contribution. So these are my two questions for you, Nishi. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Shilpa. That's like uh, quite a comprehensive question that you have uh, put to me. But, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, sayings, which I saw on a billboard outside a church once, that if you want to get something done, you'll find a way. And if not, you'll find an excuse. So I think that's the starting point for any individual and any organization about what is the change that you want to bring about and uh, you know, for any woman, woman to progress in her career, that, uh, that has to be the very starting point. And uh, you know, we are talking about bring, you know, changing it from the universe to an equiverse. And uh, normally when people say that you know, they are equal opportunity employers, so they are talking about equality, which is giving you know, a fair chance to everybody and uh, giving them the same opportunities. But really, if you look at it, that equality doesn't really translate into equity until you focus on the outcomes. So you could have a situation where you, know, you have an equal number of, uh, like we have participants today, you have equal number of men and women in the organization. But then the men progress and the women kind of, you know, stick to the sticky floor as it is called, and they don't go really beyond that. So I think it's important to really understand for each organization, what are the reasons for why this is happening? And then only we can come out with the, you know, solutions. So just to give a little uh, background about, you know, where I came from, I joined an organization which had just very recently we nationalized. There were two MNCs, SO and Caltex, which were nationalized to form Hindustan Petroleum. So there was, you know, this culture of, you know, an MNC culture, you can call it. So there were no biases or no, you know, men versus women. And it was a kind of a meritocracy. But at the same time, the women that were there were not in the core business. They were, as you rightly said, you know, at the back support functions, either HR or at best in accounts and definitely not in uh, senior positions. So for me, I was very fortunate to start my career in a department which was headed by an absolutely wonderful human being, a gentleman, of course. But at that time, you know, there was no talk about uh, you know, gender balance. There was no talk about mentoring, coaching. But this gentleman, now that I look back, was actually a true mentor to all the people who worked, you know, in his department. It gave us the freedom to experiment, the freedom to learn and to grow and, uh, you know, do things and become, I would say, leaders in our own domain. Because honestly, leadership is not really about a position per se. It's more about an attitude and you know, uh, how you excel at whatever you're doing. So I think that for me, I was extremely fortunate and I myself never ever thought of myself as a woman manager. I mean, I was just one of the, one of the boys. 
itu kan yang betul betul ni. So I, so really, uh, you know, my ethos in life has been since then that it's all about you take on challenges, you manage risks, and you deliver excellence. And I think if you stay with that, then there is really nothing which you know comes in the way of uh, you know where you want to go, where you ultimately uh, to reach. But there are definitely uh, you know a lot of challenges when at uh, in any organization. And I think the most important thing for any company to do is to create the right environment. Because and it is the tone at the top. If the first people at the top are absolutely clear that this is what they want, then as I said, you if you really want to do it, then you will make sure that you take all the right actions to make it happen. And uh, you know the business leaders also at times there are un sort of you know undocumented biases. There are biases and behaviors which are. Just so part and parcel of uh, you know people that they don't even realize that this is ultimately be- being detrimental to the working environment of in the process of uh, your at least in uh, bringing about an equity in the work- workplace. You very rightly mentioned about you know women getting into positions which are operational, right? And it happens that. You are not offered an operational position because the people who are in the decision-making uh, positions actually think that they are being kind to you by not asking you to take on a role which will involve travel, which will involve late, working late, and they actually think that they are being good to you. So sometimes it is not even done with the. You know, in that kind of a bias, I know I don't want a woman; I want only a man. They feel that they're actually, you know, helping the women. But then, what happens that when you reach, you know, you got off the sticky floor, you're somewhere in mid management, and then for future positions, unless you have the experience of, you know, operations, you're not fit for any role. And then, you know, the uh, company turns around and said, "Oh." But yeah, we definitely want to put women into senior position. But where are the women? Now you have the opportunity hasn't been given to them. So I think uh, you know the companies need to get a lot more structured around it. That yes, if you know at X percent of senior positions we want to have women in those roles, and we have women who are coming in, you know, at the intake uh, level. Then you have to have a proper transitioning and you know training and opportunities given so that they are equally ready to then take on those positions. Of course, no one is talking about you know uh, putting competency aside. It's obviously, that there has to be an equality in that. But I think it's very important to ensure that they have the same level of uh, you know ability to be able to take on uh, senior level positions. Sure. And you see here, I would like to maybe, uh, you know, ask Aditya, because you said the intent of leadership at the top makes a whole lot of difference. Now, Aditya, recently I was reading that Tata Motors have announced an all women manufacturing line for Tata Safari and Tata Harrier. Now, this came out and everybody applauded. And this is amazing piece of news. Uh, we, we rarely read a lot of these kind of uh, articles. And, uh, and everything that Nishi has said really talks about or alludes to the intent of the top leaders, whether it was her own leader who acted as a mentor, a sponsor for her to you know, grow further. And of course, competence is never, never to be questioned, uh, irrespective of uh, gender, of course. But, but since we're talking about equity, uh, there are some amazing outcomes that you were able to create uh, in the airlines business. Uh, another business where you do see women in certain roles, but those are again stereotypical uh, roles that we, you know, identify with, and you don't see them uh, across so many other roles, even in large-sized organizations. So, as you were creating India's largest and most profitable airlines, Indigo, uh, what were some of the challenges that you had, which were similar, 
but how were you able to create different outcomes and involve a lot more women in, in the kind of roles, uh, you know, Nishi was speaking about that they need to be a part of, to be able to see a way to the top. Over to you. Um, yeah, well, f first of all, it was fascinating listening to Nishi, you know, just, uh, you know, listening to a personal story of how one kind of breaks down, you know, ceilings uh, over, a, over a period of time. I think, I think it's got a somewhat uh, easier uh, now than I'm sure that when, when you know, Nish, the time that Nishi was talking about. And, and especially, you know, things like uh, oil and gas, right? I mean, seven per, the workforce participation of women in oil and gas is 7%. We're talking about Tata Motors, uh, automotive is 10%. So I, I've had the advantage of being involved in, you know, hospitality and technology um, uh, primarily uh, or, or retail uh, where there is at least there is some amount of acceptance that there are, there are women who are going to be participating in the workforce. But I think just to pick up from what Nishi was mentioning, a lot of those roles have been, you know, sticking to the floor, really, as, as you know, sticking to the sticky floor, as, as she was saying. Um, what I mean, what has been fascinating for me to see over the last 15 years is how if one really, you know, makes this a, a central agenda, right, it becomes a topic of conversation in each and every meeting. It becomes something that needs to be a factor of consideration in every role, right? Um, then what are the changes that can happen? Um, let me first kind of give you a sense of the good news. You know, what, what, is the, what is the positive outcome that we were able to create, right? Um, Indigo today has the largest number of, largest percentage and number of women pilots in the world. In the 10 years that I ran Indigo and the 14 years that I was involved in it, the highest percentage of F women airport managers. Uh, I had a third of my leadership team as women. Um, so HR was headed by a woman, operations control was headed by a woman, uh, administration was headed by a woman, in-flight was headed by a woman, tax was headed by a woman, learning and development was headed by a woman. Uh, so, so therefore, you know, and when, when, when we think about the airline business or when I talk about Indigo or now Akasa, for example, uh, people immediately think, oh yeah, but you had a lot of women in the in-flight operations in cabin crew. But that's why I'm quick to point out that we also had the largest percentage of women aircraft maintenance engineers, right? 30% a, a of managers and above were women, right? Um, women would get actually paid more than men, you know? So now, but how did this happen? It did not happen by accident. When I first took on the CEO role, 18% of the workforce was women. When I left after 10 years, it was 43% of the workforce was women, right? Or for that, for that matter, in Akasa today, from day one, you know, there's almost a 50-50 in, in everything that we do. And one has to kind of, take several steps, but I think the very first one is intent, but intent where that intent is then translated into action on a day-to-day -day basis, item number one. Item number two is how do we first solve for the top of the funnel? You know, if, if, in the, if let's, let's say there's a job opening and one, one rule that I had was give me 50% resumes of men and women to start with. Because if I go through the natural, you know, process, 80% of the resumes will be men. 20% of the women are now fighting through six levels of, of interview process. So naturally, the, just mathematically, the probability becomes less. The third is that, you know, Basic infrastructure, right? Whether it is mobility, whether it is workplace, whether it is washrooms. And, and I'm not only talking about head offices and, and offices. I'm talking about 60 different airports, everything from Dibrugar to Mumbai, right? Um, then flexi timing well before it became even something that was that or work from home well before it became fashionable or the, or the need of the hour. Uh, 
flexible contract so that women could take weekdays off because their husbands could then be available for the children on the weekends you know for instance or take 15 days on 15 days off contract so that you know then they could they could kind of um, you know ded give dedicated time to to their home or other other pursuits um training and learning uh, interventions for for uh, people who are breaking out from where they originally started off let's say you originally started off in in flight services but you want to become a pilot or you want to become uh, so i had i had india indigo cabin crew who ultimately were in flight safety in the legal team in the tax team in the finance team in the you know uh, engineering team and so on and so forth but again that cannot happen just by accident right one has to kind of provide and create an enabling environment women going taking a, a a time off during maternity or the early early years of their children when they come back to the workforce what are the trainer wheels that you give extra so that they can you know catch up with and then come back to the same level of promotion cycle that that they left off from you know uh so that it doesn't look like you know okay i took a three year break and now i'm forever going to be three years behind you know and lose out on the on the opportunities so i think there's a ton of detail but i'll tell you i'll i'll, I'll before I, before we go to sondaria I'll, i'll 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 leave behind one one story so uh, two stories maybe you know um one was that we want we had a lot of women engineers but in our planning department lot not in line maintenance at the airports so every day like you know every week i'm reviewing this and i'm like you know what's going on and the and the head of engineering assures me that there is no bias no nothing i investigate and that there's actually no bias but but when when women go to line maintenance in the hangar at the airport after 2 3 4 5 months they again want to shift back to planning so i can't figure out what is going on so you know i go to the hangar i spend some time so this is at the delhi airport because our main maintenance base was in delhi the delhi airport our hangar was closer to t3 our operations were in mandi but so you know people there was a gate from the t3 area and people would enter when i went and started talking and i started speaking this is some really funny thing that i found out tragically funny that the women have to go all the way to terminal 1d enter the airport take this massive 8 km ride around the runway to come to the aircraft hangar and then go back and while the men are just entering the hangar straight away so like why is that happening because there is no woman cisf security staff at that gate so there cannot be frisking done of women so women have to go all the way around it's somewhat silly and funny but just imagine that one you know one unconscious bias was there because of which the women had to spend an extra one hour traveling back and forth entering through another gate at another end of the airport or for that matter when we wanted to do women drivers cab drivers to transport our our colleagues in gurgaon in those days unconscious bias but women were not given driving licenses for commercial vehicles you could drive you could take a driving license and you know drive a maruti 800 but you can't drive a cab now that took another battle to so what i'm trying to say is there is intention there is a plan there is an execution and then there is this grit of being able to the tenacity to keep going at it but the but the joyful part of it is that you know you do break through certain certain you know statistics that have been around for a long time you you mentioned 49.6% of the world's population being women the stunning thing is 80% of all consumers are women but globally less than 40% of women are in the workforce so there are these crazy you know numbers which which are a very telling reality and this is a great segue aditya thanks for that uh, this is a great segue to come to you dr sondarya you've been working in this space for years and years now 
um, what as for you really needs to change in the work environment, in our social environment, in the, the policies, um, you know, that are being made, and also in the mindset of women themselves, are we women holding ourselves back more than we need to? So what as for you uh, needs to change if you could give a quick sort of dive into, into your perspective on this? Thank you, Shilpa. And uh, I have to echo what Aditya mentioned about uh, being in awe of uh, uh, Ma'am Nishi Vasudeva. She is someone that we quote constantly in our sessions. And, uh, you know, we have actually done a deep research about her career and how she was the first woman engineer and the way in which she kind of grew. So it's uh, awesome to, uh, you know, be part of the same panel as you. Um, Shilpa, uh, let me begin at the beginning. Um, the business case for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, specific reference to women, is one that has been proven again and again and yet again. And one of the beautiful ways in which this was emphatically stated was when COVID struck and we noticed when I say we, I'm talking about uh, Team Avatar, my colleagues and I, uh, who run uh, one of India's largest gender analytics study called the Avatar and Ceramount Best Companies for Women in India. And we have over 400 organizations that participate in it, um, several companies that are here in this forum too. And uh, many of these organizations had already begun the journey of not only having equitable workplace policies, of providing flexibility, not because it was uh, you know, a nice to have, but because it actually created a robust culture in the organization. And also because they felt truly that diversity is a big enabler of business. And these organizations we found, they actually managed the COVID pandemic and the wuka that was unleashed into the world very, very admirably. They were able to bounce back. They were able to quickly pivot into the flexible mode of working for everyone, not just women. And they were also able to assist women professionals in, a, in, in their ability to manage life and work. So diversity is here to stay. Gender inclusion is something that everyone uh, you know, agrees is essential for growth and uh, the purpose of having better policies, equitable policies, is because an organization should not just look, uh, you know, at top line and bottom line, but also look at sustainability being part of what we today call ESG. Um, why do women leave? You know, this is a question that. Uh, uh, my team and I at Avatar have spent decades trying to answer. Ever since I started Avatar in the year 2000, uh, you know, as a response to the fact that when I quit the workplace, uh, you know, as a young banker, and then uh, wanted to make my own re-entry, but found that talent managers were uh, rather straight-jacketed in their approach to what kind of, uh, you know, profiles they would be very happy to to have in their workplace, uh, I felt a deep sense of uh, anger. And uh, you know that anger kind of resulted in creating an organization where we told very boldly, if I may add, that we only hire women and we only uh, enable the return to work of women who have taken breaks in career. These were the profiles, you know, in back in the day when it was not soft copy, but hard copy, these were the profiles that would go into the waste paper basket. These were the profiles when people would cross out with red, saying she has taken a three-year break, and they would then you know, reject it and chuck it. We said, those are our profiles. Those are the profiles we will represent. And so I realized that while it takes anger to start off a social enterprise, it takes a lot of empathy to actually build it and to understand what were those challenges that these talent managers were experiencing, which caused them to reject 
the profiles of these women? What were the challenges that made them think that someone with a six year break is uh, not fit for employment anymore? And when we delved deeper into those questions, we realized that skilling was actually the answer. If you possessed those skills, then it didn't matter if you had taken a break or not. It didn't matter if you were, uh, you know, at home tending to your children. It didn't matter that you followed an itinerant husband halfway around the world and then came back and picked up where your career, you know, had last dropped off. So short answer to your question, I think uh, it is an effort that is required you know, from everyone's side. The organization has to realize the value of gender inclusion and gender diversity. The uh, educational institutions have to create both men and women who value diversity, who are aware of their own non-conscious biases, who want to be a part of a world that is inclusive. But most importantly, I think it's the woman who has to be intentional. Uh, when I mentioned Ma'am Nishi Vasudeva and I said we quote her often in our training programs, it's because we speak about her intentionality. And uh, career intentionality is, is this uh, you know, vector principle. It has both speed and direction. And it kind of you know, takes you, uh, you know, allows you to kind of relegate those problems to the background and uh, you know, really uh, show the world who you are. And I think that's the kind of uh, spirit we want to see from the Indian woman professional. And I think she is really the answer uh, to her own challenges. Yes, absolutely. And I think a lot of onus back on the women to be more intentional and build their careers with more intention. This is something that I very much believe in personally as well. But here I would also like to now go to you, Anuradha. Um, you work in an organization we can safely call as one of the more progressive ones. Uh, and we know Nishi sits on your board as well um, today. So, um, so, so it's it's a quote from your CEO that I'd like to read out, saying that diversity is the most sustainable driver of innovation and a primary genome of resilience. Um, with thirty percent of the HCL board members being women, um, you having a diverse board compared to many other large or similar sized organizations and a progressive CEO. Um, you know, how has that really helped you as a practical example we want to share with the audience? And this is to the audience, please keep your questions coming to the panelists. This is your opportunity to ask them, give the name of the panelists you want to ask the question and put your question in the chat. As I go back to asking Anuradha that, you know, how has this allowed you to build a more inclusive organization and is this inclusion showing up in your ability to have more senior women leaders and uh, also in retention of uh, women right at the top? What would you say uh, is the outcome? And are there any challenges that you still face um, given the fact that we are in an environment that is actually not as conducive as what you might see or have created within HCL today? Thank you, Shilpa. Thank you uh, so much for the question. Uh, it's my privilege to be on this uh, panel with uh, Dr. Nishi Vasudevan, who is on our uh, board, uh, having Dr. Sandarya Rajesh uh, on this panel, whom we uh, really have uh, taken a lot of learnings from our organizations and her personally into the kind of work that we are doing at uh, HCL Tech. Um, and also hearing Aditya and uh, the success stories at Indigo and all the learnings that he's now taking to Akasa Air. By the way, I took my first Akasa Air flight yesterday from Bangalore to Chennai uh, and did experience some of the things that he was talking about. Uh, coming to, uh, you know, HCL Tech, no, HCL Tech. Uh, we at HCL Tech, you know, strongly believe that uh, nurturing a culture that embraces uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it doesn't come with a playbook. Uh, and uh, finding the right formula for success uh, takes a real commitment from everyone in the organization, uh, right from the executive leadership, 
uh, to the uh, employee who has just joined us uh, recently. Uh, so when we as an organization say uh, diversity, equity and inclusion are, uh, you know, uh, the value of uh, heart at our workplace, uh, we mean, uh, you know, that the commitment to DEI, um, uh, you know, in our organization uh, starts at a board level committee. Uh, it's a very unique uh, thing that we have at HCL. You would have heard of, you know, other committees that are there in board. Uh, many years back, uh, we uh, set up a board level diversity, equity and inclusion committee, which comprises of uh, board members, our CEO, our CHRO, all reviewing the diversity, equity and inclusion charters. Uh, so as we started, you know, to advance our own uh, DI journey, uh, many things became clear. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, creating a DI framework is not about checking a box. It has to be well thought out, uh, most importantly, genuine. It has to be genuine and it has to be reflective of uh, the company's true values. Uh, it has, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the kind of operations that we have across multiple countries, uh, we've got, we had to look at a multi-dimensional approach, look at all aspects of diversity, and also parallelly consider, you know, uh, every aspect of our business. Um, uh, and from an employee perspective, look at everything from uh, employee attraction to employee retention, to employee growth, to employee uh, development. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, we also strongly believe that uh, diversity without inclusion, as there is a popular quote, you know, that it leads to a revolving door of talent. Uh, so we very strongly, uh, firmly believe that, uh, you know, inclusion is what unlocks diversity. And therefore, there is a lot of focus in our organization to cultivate inclusion. Uh, you know, before we start tackling uh, matters of diversity. And we have seen the results of that also. Uh, so whether we talk from a gender perspective, I heard on, you know, a workplace gender bias and how it can uh, obstruct the growth of women. I would, uh, you know, uh, um, reflect upon it from all the pillars of diversity, be it persons with special abilities, uh, be it LGBTQ, cultural inclusion, uh, etc. Uh, the leadership, um, uh, you know, uh, the identity, um, leadership identity of uh, companies' entire uh, population makes all the difference. So what uh, Dr. Nishi also talked about, setting the tone at the top is of utmost importance. And that actually has helped us uh, accelerate our journey uh, on uh, the, uh, on this uh, path. Um, Unconscious bias, uh, you know, uh, could be uh, embedded in um, stereotype organizational practices. We heard of how uh, difficult it can be hard to detect uh, uh, of an example of not having a CIS, a women personal placed at the right point. And these are, you know, uh, these, uh, uh, you've got to make people aware of it and see how you can, uh, you know, probably uh, change things around it. So um, creating a conducive environment um, for, uh, you know, the advancement of uh, women uh, in leadership roles uh, is very, very pertinent and important. And we clearly understand that, you know, looking at each layer of leadership, be it the mid-level layer, be it the senior level layer, be it the various functions that are there or lines of business or, uh, you know, enabling functions, operations, delivery, sales, uh, a lot of things could be done by just um, understanding the value of uh, inclusive leadership because that builds uh, an inclusive culture in the organization and that itself will, you know, with the tone at the top and a systemic tone, uh, you know, tone and a top-down approach, uh, if adopted well, uh, along with uh, building inclus inclusive behaviors and habits, will uh, really help uh, each one of us, uh, each one of us uh, you know, accelerate the journey. So we basically, uh, you know, at HCL Tech take pride uh, in combining all these uh, values, uh, nurturing uh, them, and uh, we've seen this deliver value to all the uh, stakeholders. And from an employee perspective, uh, looking at, you know, uh, every um, uh, thing from the lens of, of uh, every pillar, 
with the lens of talent attraction, retention, and uh, development. If you look at all this in tandem uh, with a unified experience on promoting inclusive culture, um, all uh, the talent um, you know, um, management practices will surely uh, lead to a more uh, diverse and inclusive uh, culture. And um, uh, I, you know, some of the things that worked um, well for us and our programs have been designed around that uh, is, uh, as I uh, said, you know, leadership commitment, which is most important. So the diversity council that we have, um, uh, you know, would go through the charter that we have for the organization across all the pillars. Uh, there are uh, mandates for business leaders to have senior women leaders as their direct reports. We measure uh, these metrics on a regular basis to see where the needle is moving and where it isn't, what more could be done on what else is lacking. We also encourage interaction of our um, uh, you know, women leaders with our board members. We tried out uh, something new over I think five to six quarters uh, pre-COVID days where the women leaders got a chance to interact with the board members over lunch. So the day of the board level committee meeting, uh, we uh, during the lunch time we used to, uh, you know, schedule meetings with say three board members and three women leaders, uh, and uh, you know it was a great opportunity to gather views and suggestions to enhance um, uh, the practices around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, it gave us uh, quite um, valuable inputs. Board members were able to hear the uh, women leaders' perspective, and um, uh, you know, women leaders got an opportunity to interact uh, with the board members. Uh, and uh, the, the you know uh, the uh, other aspect which I want to share, which works well for us, is you know this whole compelling thing of building inclusive leadership capabilities and driving a, a you know culture of inclusion across uh, every interaction it could be uh, during the recruitment stage it could be during performance discussions career discussions so we have created something very unique at hcl called inclusion lab uh, and it is basically for our leaders managers individual contributors to um, uh, you know go through a unified learning experience uh, to um, you know, understand inclusive behaviors, to understand what to do more, what to do uh, less. And we firmly believe that uh, if you are not uh, actively including, you are accidentally excluding. Uh, that is something that we firmly uh, believe I, I in. I completely agree with you there, um, Anuradha. And I think you know, all that you shared with us just tells us that yes, it is a whole lot of work. But done with intention, done with persistence, done with uh, focus, and um, I would say the the optimism that you can still create an outcome, uh, even though the conditions may not be all conducive. I think that's something that you've really proven. I I'll go to Aditya now to take one question pertaining to rural women, and then I'll come back to all three of you ladies to ask one question each from the audience. Uh, that we have because we'll just have about time for uh, that. Um, yeah. So Aditya, the question to you is that while we discuss so much pertaining to the urban sector and the whole case for equity, uh, you know, and all the research centers primarily around that, um, there's, there's very little conversation about uh, the, the woman in the rural areas and the fact that she also does not have access to mainstream sustainable uh, employment. Right, uh, and something that just erodes not only on her self-respect, dignity, status in society, but also keeps uh, our villages away from the prosperity that they so deserve to have because women are not seen as, uh, you know, deserving of the equity, um, perhaps even. So, so what's been your experience with SEVA especially? And what do you think the private sector can do even more in their capacity to create more mainstream sustainable employment opportunities for rural women. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely the unemployment rate is obviously much higher in uh, the rural areas uh, as opposed to urban. Even though even urban is is you know very very low statistics, uh, unemployment rate uh, in for urban female graduates is thirty five percent. You know, for, uh, for example or less than 20% of women uh, 15 and older 
are participating in the labor workforce right so so we have a we have a complex you know issue on our on our hands but in rural areas of course it's it's gets compounded by many other factors you know where there are there are social norms there are mobility issues you know going from one village to another one, you know village to the block level and so on and so forth there are um, you know there's a child care burden and uh, an un unequal division of of labor uh, at home there is a power imbalance um, and then there are of course safety issues you know at at workplaces now the other having said that the other interesting bit is that 98% of businesses that are owned by women are micro enterprises right and at seva of course you know we work with 2 million nearly 2 million women members all of whom are self employed so somebody can be a you know bd roller or somebody could be you know making products from waste to something else somebody could be a rag picker somebody could be um you know making garments and thread and stitching and so on and so forth but having said that the success has been that uh, and how we've been able to create livelihood opportunities and be able to create a livelihood increasing the better livelihood opportunities is one with collective struggle you know so uh, there is there is no doubt about the fact that that bringing you know everybody together behind a few few objectives is hugely powerful second you know it creates role models that one can see in and around from similar backgrounds similar homes similar rural areas where one when when somebody says ki acha and so on and so forth uh the third is that there is it it takes a lot of time and patience to do this thing you know whether it is uh working with you you were mentioning kach and that young lady who puts me on test ki whether i can make rotis or not and um, now the these salt pan workers i mean this thing is this has been a struggle or this has been a movement for the last 15 17 years you know before we have been able to see some some you know credible uh, results on the ground so basically collective struggle you know role models that that people can see in the areas that they are working in third is just the patience and tenacity that that it takes fourth is of being able to take the problem and break it down into literally one on one you know that that break it down to the most basic level and start building a solution from there first principles yeah absolutely yeah. so first yeah absolutely going back to first principles and and see and 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 the and the uh, and of course huge amount of capacity building that has gone but once that happens the the pace at which the social norms get broken is also incredibly pleasantly surprising you know you you would think i think i'll have to ask you to hold, to the... hold on that good note we we want to come to the end of our discussion but thank you i think those are all very very pertinent uh, points and i definitely wanted to include the the cause of the rural woman as well on this panel and not exclude that from our discussion or from our attention today but now we just have i'm told uh, you know time for taking up one question uh, and i'd like to pose that to uh, nishi Nishi, this question is for you. Uh, that we all agree that mindset change is very important to bring about change. Are there any resources that can help with mindset change within an organization? So, if you could quickly uh, share from your experience or what you feel could be a good resource um, for for mindset change to happen within an organization. Okay. Uh, so while I answer that, can I just request for that one 
Yes, so, I in and, fact wanted to end on that as well because that's also a good note. Aditya ended on a good note. Um, uh, we all want to end on that good note. So could we please have the picture that Nishi is requesting and let her allude to that and answer this question as well. Yeah, because I think it's uh, all around mindsets, not just within the organization because ultimately we are all part of society, right? So the yes. people who are working there, whether they are the bosses or the juniors, Correct. if we can just, if can everybody see that? So I think we have this situation that everybody needs to work together to bring in that uh, concept of what we are talking about, equity at the workplace. There has to be equity outside the workplace also, so that the women are then equally equally empowered uh, as are the men and uh, i think during covid times some of this has dawned on men who are forced to stay at home and work from home to realize that what exactly is it that the women who are either what we call as housewives or the ones who are doing a double role uh, at work and at home have to really contend with and uh, i think it's a change all around once society changes then all the people who are coming into the workplace are coming from that change society and hopefully things will uh, work for the better and just like to add with one small thing that right through my working career i have been asked a million times how do you manage both work and home the day any man gets asked that question we would have achieved our equity thanks <laughs> Thank you, Nishi. Um, and and the day that you know your promotion to CMD was announced, I know you broke the glass ceiling and you hit the headlines literally uh, right up there, and you were on the the front page, the top uh, on on the newspapers that day, telling women, men, everybody out there that it is possible. If it's possible in this industry, it is possible everywhere. If this woman can do it, so can every woman out there. So on this note, I would like to thank our uh, panel. Thank you very much for your uh, very interesting insights, data, uh, as well as experiences and stories. I think they will stay with the audience. I'd like to thank the audience as well. You were very active with your questions. I hope we can get back to uh, some of you at least in terms of the answers uh, from our experts. And, um, and I would really like this conversation to go with all of you out there to our ecosystem to really see that how can it catalyze change where it needs to happen? How can it reach all stakeholders? How can it reach all policymakers? Because, you know, together we can accomplish so much. And the intent is that with equity in the workspaces, we also look at prospering together and have much more meaningful, fulfilling lives that we all lead. Uh, on that note, Nikita, I'd like to hand over back to you for our next session. Thank you, panel, once again for being with us. And Talentnomics, may you grow from strength to strength, bringing these stories to the world and making change possible, one person at a time, one organization at a time. Over to you, Nikita. Thank you very much. Thank you so much shilpa i basically don't know what to say what a phenomenal session thanks to all the wonderful panelists and uh, thanks again shilpa for moderating the discussion so well and leaving us with some very impactful progressive and unconventional best practices in the three areas as you i like how you categorized at the beginning of the session non stereotypical roles stronger pipeline of women leaders and equitable future at work and Mr. Ghosh's story on Indigo, wow, tells us what unconscious bias can lead to. And I really liked how our panelists put career intention is a vector. It has both speed and direction. And if you're not consciously including, you are accidentally excluding. And the most important, equity at the workplace also depends on equity outside the workplace. So aptly put. Thank you once again to all our panelists for a very rich discussion. And before we go to the next session, I would like to draw your attention to the poll Disha announced a while ago. 
don't forget to check out the results on the platform. Thanks once again for participating and over to Disha for our next session. Thank you.